Welcome to Global Currents, coming to you from Simon Fraser University's WASC Center for Dialogue in Vancouver. Each week, we showcase the work of independent Canadian filmmakers whose stories, like this building, are designed to encourage debate. Hello, I'm Kevin Newman, and the documentary we're about to present certainly fits that mission. In a twist on that old philosophical question, we ask, if a tree faller dies in the forest, does anyone hear? Logging has been crucial to the development of this country, yet it remains just about the most dangerous line of work around. And no job in that industry is more hazardous than faller. Now because of cutbacks and contracting out, that job has become even deadlier. Facing stereotypes as risk takers and rednecks, fallers are now fighting back against what they say has gone so wrong in the woods. Here's death in the forest. Forests of coastal British Columbia produce the greatest volume of living matter any place on the planet. For generations, these trees have supplied the world with one of our most basic commodities. The backbone of BC's economy, the forest industry generates annually over $18 billion. But behind this enormous windfall, hides one of the industry's darkest secrets, a staggering toll of death and injury. You have to have a positive attitude. Uh, it's not gonna happen to you. You know, I'm not born to die in the woods. In the last 20 years alone, 650 forestry workers were killed and more than 5,000 severely injured. Of all employees in the woods, Fallers, the frontline workers who take down trees, have paid the biggest price. What other industry anywhere has a statistic that says that six out of ten people that go into it have guaranteed one thing? And that one thing you're guaranteed is you're going to be hurt. The only question is how badly. It takes a lot of focus and concentration, and if you drop your focus even for one split second, that's all it takes, and down you go. Falling has always been one of the world's most dangerous professions. But in recent years, the job has become even more dangerous through contracting out and cutbacks on safety. The industry's attitude toward fallers is just spiraling out of control. Like, we had a proud profession, and now it's just, it's really gone. It's tough to see, it's tough to watch happen. Like millions of other working Canadians, fallers have seen their workplaces transformed. But because of the inherent danger of their job, they're paying for these changes with their lives. I started in the bush because generations of my family. My grandfather did it, my father did it, I grew up in a camp. That's all I ever heard about. So it was a natural thing for me. Family tradition. Everybody thinks you get into falling for the money. It has a certain attraction, but if you don't love the work, it wouldn't matter what they paid you for doing it. You wouldn't stay with it. And I mean, I've been doing it almost 30 years. I've been smashed up, I've had logs roll over me, I've had things come out of trees and hit me and knock me out for three months. And you still get up and you go back falling. But unless you're out there and you're doing it, there's no other job like it. I see parts of this country that probably only one or 2% of the population ever see. Most of them have to pay for the privilege of going and looking at it. I get paid to go there. They dropped me on this hillside. I'm up there all day by myself. If I do a good job, I get the credit. 
And if I do a bad job and I get criticized for it, I can live with it because that's my mistake. But when you're tied in with a crew of guys, the quality of the job depends on everybody around you. And I don't like that. So that's why I do it. It's hard to say when I first started because I worked with my dad back in New Brunswick ever since I was old enough to work. But I first started getting paid in about 1966, I guess. To be a follower in them days was to be somebody. Like, you're recognized as a professional, like a doctor, a lawyer. You're in the same pay range and that sort of thing. So it was a very attractive occupation at that time. Out here, I answer to me. I kind of like the, the physical challenge because it keeps in good shape. And it's interesting. I don't know, I just like the independence of how it just suits my character. I started in 1976 at Crown Delavac in Sandspit on the Queen Charlotte Island. There was a shortage of men, so I went to work for him as a chokerman. Everybody kept saying, oh, you should be a faller, so I just kept telling the foreman, I want to be a faller. Best thing about being a faller is you're by yourself. And so you get to be outdoors in the fresh air all day, work really hard, and nobody's looking over your shoulder. And that's pretty hard to beat. Since the late 1800s, harvesting the giant trees of Canada's west coast has been much more than just a job. A unique combination of strength, skill, and determination, fallers became proud icons of the great north woods. It's easily the hardest physical job you run into. And if you can cut it and do it, then that, among working men, that's, that's what they respect is a hard work ethic. It takes a certain person to go out there and pit yourself against those trees and, and come home every night. You're there by yourself. There isn't somebody there cracking the whip. If you didn't want to work, you didn't make any money. They're highly motivated people, and we still are today. It takes a lot of pride to do this job, to do this job and to do it well. It takes a lot of honor, too. And the guys that are professional, good, honest guys, you can tell right away from their character. But the job of falling is not what it used to be. Sweeping changes in the forest industry have made any sense of pride and honor difficult to maintain. Monday, a river of truck tra traffic stretching from Mexico to Canada. Trade corridor or problem pipeline. Monday on Global National News Understood. Right from the beginning, the gifts are what we're after. What do you want? What did you wish for? What did you get? But we all grow older, maybe a little wiser. And eventually, it hits us. The giving's the thing. The giving, that's the thing. Give the perfect gift. Give from the bay. Ain't it good? Ain't it right? That you are with me here tonight. The music playing, a body swaying in time. Rock me gently. Rock me slowly. Baby, baby, rock me gently. Introducing the new all Jeep Liberty. Are you fit to drive after a night like this? A global news experiment proves many drinkers are still impaired in the morning. This is a groundbreaking study that just happened. I thought I would have been completely fine sitting behind the wheel. Apparently I wasn't. Police saw our global news drinking test and now... is resulting in changes at the OPP. It's a great thing that you did. Expect to see a lot more OPP ride checks in the morning hours. Making our roads safer. Global news reminds you, please don't drink and drive this holiday season.
Fallers on the West Coast were once regarded as providers. But since the environmental reforms of the 1980s, their livelihood has been controversial. This morning is the beginning of the Clockwood Sound blockades and the end of clear-cut logging in Clockwood Sound. Yeah. Although they have no control over forest policy, to much of urban Canada, fallers are responsible for unsustainable logging practices. There's a public perception out there that these guys are inextricably linked with the rape of the natural world. I find it a really curious kind of attitude because you cannot help but respect the demands that are placed on them to do what they do. But what gets lost for most people in the city is that they never see that. And, and what they see uh, oftentimes are, are pictures of denuded landscapes and they immediately fault whoever is involved, and fallers are in the front line in that regard for, for what has happened, but lose sight of the fact that they're making their criticisms in homes that are built with the products that those people are providing. The image of loggers in general has really deteriorated, I think from a lack of understanding by the public mostly. They've been told that loggers are bad, and so that's it. <laughs> loggers are bad. So you just kind of get used to it. Everybody hates fallers. Everybody always will hate them. It's just the nature of the job. But the worst attacks on fallers have come from within the forest industry itself. I'd never let my son come in the woods. This is four generations of one family. And he asked me three different times. I've tried to explain it to him. I got too much love and respect for you to ever let you do what I do. If the job was the same today as it was when I started, I would have gladly taken him with me. But the way it's going, there's no respect anymore. And uh, it's the last thing that I would ever encourage anybody to do. I've broken in lots of young guys, and the first thing I try to tell them is, why don't you find something else to do? If you really want to do this, I'm going to teach you the best way I can so you can hopefully stay alive. But I would really encourage you to go look at something else. Falling trees has always been dangerous. Bad weather, dead and rotten trees, and hung up limbs called widow makers are all part of the job. For fallers, dismantling mother nature can be unforgiving. You're trying to take these huge objects that are, most, most of them are alive, you're killing them. It's only fair that they try and strike back. That's the way I look at it. You know, if you want to know, what's going on, pick up a piece of firewood and, and then multiply that like 10,000 times. Uh, you know, that's what, that's what you're playing around with. It's just tremendous weight. Sometimes you just, you have to fall snags, dead trees that are in the forest. I've walked up to snags and, uh, you know, dug my saw into them. And as soon as I touch it, the whole thing just disintegrates and starts coming down around you in big, huge chunks that weigh 5,000 pounds each piece. And only by the grace of God, you better be quick on your feet. And maybe you can get out of there, maybe you can't. And the lucky ones are here talking to you and the other ones are dead or crippled. You fall a million trees in your lifetime and you're taking a shot with every single one of them, trying to put them into a specific place. And it doesn't always go according to plan. I've seen trees and logs move faster than a snake could strike you because it's gravity and it's 200 ton. And when that decides to move, it's moving. Okay, are we all ready here? Yep. Which way is it going? I want to try to lay it as low as I can to save it out, right? Like that's the... 
Cross our fingers. Hope to die. So we'll aim for right, boom, there. In my experience, it demands the most mental attention. I mean, if you make a mistake in this racket, something's going to happen. It might not be serious. It, it might just be a little scratch, what we call a cheap lesson, but you know, or just a broken bone or something. But you make a mistake, something, something's going to happen. You have to deal with whatever you come up against and make it safe. We're supposed to leave it safe for everybody else behind us. That's our primary goal, besides staying alive. On the rugged west coast, one of the greatest risks to fallers is extreme terrain. Most of the flat ground on the valley bottoms is now harvested by machine, leaving mountainsides and cliffs to be fallen by hand. They've got us in areas now that uh, are just, I call them goat shows. And, uh, you know, I'd like to even see a goat walking around in some of this stuff. Well, I've seen places where the engineers who lay the ribbons out for the blocks can't walk where the ribbon goes, so they stand on the top of the cliff and they take the roll of ribbon and they throw it off the cliff and wherever it rolls, that's where the block line is. And then we're supposed to take our gear, our packs, our gas and oil and our chainsaws and our wedge belts and our axes and somehow get up on that cliff where the engineers barehanded couldn't climb and we're supposed to take all our work gear and go up there and fall the trees that are up there. Well, is there something wrong with that picture? You know? And the last guy that tried it, uh, working, I think, for Fedgie, and he, he broke his neck. And then they, they came along later and said, geez, maybe this is a little unreasonable. So they deleted out that part of the block, but not until the guy broke his neck. As fallers often work in terrain inaccessible by road, even getting from camp to the job site involves a high degree of risk. Just taking a helicopter ride up here every day is making it a whole lot more dangerous. You can avoid a lot of danger by experience, knowing what to do, where, when. But it doesn't change the fact there's an awful lot of fatalities out here that can't be changed. And I don't care what anybody says, all accidents aren't preventable. Your number's up and there's nothing's going to change it. No other industry in BC, a province of high-risk industries, comes close to the number of fatalities in the forests. This loss of life has taken a terrible toll on families, on communities, and on fellow fallers. I remember my best friend got killed when I was about 25, and it was a tough thing to deal with. It affected me a lot because until that particular fatality, I was invincible. Nothing was going to hurt me, but that was a rude awakening. I think I'm still dealing with it, probably. He was my best friend for as long as I can remember. Sad because you know, like now, like the industry is uh, stepping back so bad. Like you know, those guys that died it doesn't mean nothing anymore. It's just hard to deal with. I don't know how to explain it. I can count 17 people dead that in the last 36 years. Three of them were really close to me. Matty Hakarinen died on Nook Island. I knew this guy before he married Gracie Ellen. I knew him before his kids were born. Tony Smith was my fallen partner the year before he died. We were working for CFI, and the next year he died in Tokart Bay. And Ted Gramlich 
I've flown trees with Ted Gramlich for 25 years. And when, when Turbo Ted got killed, uh, that just about finished me. I just thought, God damn it, you know, do none of us get out of this alive? <laughs> Nobody makes it. And for him to die the way he did, a five-minute flight from a hospital, and he laid on the hill and bled out for two hours, you know, it's just there was so much stuff wrong with that. And that just, you know, that's the state of the industry, the way it's going and the corporations passing the buck and nobody accepting responsibility and putting the onus on the workers. And there's so much wrong with this now, you know, that they've taken a job that I love doing. It's the greatest job in the world, and they're ruining it. Falling the trees is the easy part. It's dealing with all the other bullshit that comes along with it. That's, that's ruining it. The Canadian Cancer Society Lottery's early bird deadline is this Friday. Buy your ticket now and you could win one of three early bird prizes of $100,000. Hurry. Only six days left. Order your ticket today. Any Tim Hortons lover would be excited to get our new mug and their favorite coffee. Wow. It doesn't get any better than this. Oh, thank you. Now imagine if they also got a quick pay Tim card. Woo! Yes! I love you guys. <laughs> I didn't know you cared this much. Tim Hortons new China Mug. Only $6.95 with a packet of coffee or a quick pay Tim card. Give, sell, and joy every day. What's wrong with my dishwasher? Well, here's your problem. Over time, lime scale and grease can build up in hard to see places like the heating coil and sprayer arms. Use Jet Dry Dishwasher Cleaner once a month to remove buildup and help keep your dishwasher working like it should. Jet Dry for a sparkling shine every time. It's time to get in and drive during Ford's year end clearance. Come in for the best prices of the season on most 07 and 08s. And now get up to $5,500 in Canadian delivery allowance plus an additional $1,250 e-bonus and more. Hurry into your local Ford store or go to Ford.ca today. Hammers are great for driving nails, but now there's a top quality hammer that does more. The new Benchmark 6-in-1 Multi-Tool, only at Home Hardware and Home Building Center. The fully guaranteed Tool Steel 6-in-1 is also a powerful wrench, wire cutter and twister, even a paint can opener. Switch instantly from one job to another. Pick up your Benchmark 6-in-1 Multi-Tool today, only at Home Hardware. Excuse me, sir. Are you the famous Colgate 360? Yes, I am. Is it true you have a tongue cleaner? Actually, it's a cheek and tongue cleaner. Wow. You see, kid, 80% of bacteria are not on your teeth. Colgate 360 cleans teeth, gums, cheeks, and tongue, removing more bacteria for a whole mouth clean. I want to have a cheek and tongue cleaner just like you. <laughs> Colgate 360 is now also available with the power of sonic vibrations. Colgate 360 Microsonic Power for a healthier whole mouth clean. Colgate, recommended by dentists. Closed captioning of this program is brought to you in part by Dominion Lending Centers. Need a mortgage? A mortgage? Think Dominion Lending Centers. Find a mortgage professional at dominionlending.ca. For decades, the forest industry in BC has been controlled by a few giant timber companies. Once locally owned, years of mergers and acquisitions have resulted in corporations that are now multinational. Along the way, unionized workforces, including fallers, were deemed an unnecessary expense. All of the big timber companies, Interfor, Canfor, Western, Timber West, they're all slowly chipping away at getting rid of their union employees. Some of them are worse than others. Timber West, I believe, has got rid of all of their union fallers, and they're working at all of their union employees. They've stated right in the, in the paper that they don't have any Timber West employees working in the forestry sector. You're one of the largest companies in British Columbia, and you don't have any employees that you accept any responsibility for. You don't pay any pension plan. You don't pay any benefits. You contract everything out. I'm not sure that that's something that you should be bragging about. That's, that's what's wrong with the industry as a whole. They're forcing us to become independent contractors and accept all of the responsibility and the liability for, for everything. 
In an industry plagued by deaths and accidents, timber companies have rid themselves of liability by contracting out the actual logging operations. In order to be hired, an independent faller must have a one-man company and carry his own liability. When I started falling in 1978, you couldn't run your own company. Nobody would hire you. And now, if you don't have a company, you don't get a job. So in 29 years, there's the difference. It's exactly the opposite. The timber companies also offloaded their responsibility for safety programs onto fallers themselves. You can roll everything back to corporate greed. They'll do anything to increase corporate profit. That's it. That's their agenda right there in a nutshell. Well, you know, there's only so many corners you can cut here. You can, you can, you know, cut the wages. Uh, you can cut the benefit package. And then there's certain things that you can just throw out the window. And, uh, and safety is, is number one. Safety costs money. If you run a safety program properly, it costs you money. The logging crew is now looked at as just a, you know, meat on the hoof. The companies would like to get it to where anybody can go do it, and that's the machine idea. Years ago, when I worked in Crown Teller back in Sandspit, they sent up an efficiency guy, and that was in 76, and he said, you know, they would spend a million dollars on a machine to get rid of one man. So that's where they would like to get falling to. They can get rid of the skilled labor, and they don't have a problem. But timber companies still rely heavily on skilled labor, especially fallers, who work daily with trees that are too difficult to be harvested by machine. Well, the first thing uh, that you do when you show up with something like this is, uh, you know, you assess the tree. And then this one here is different because it's split, it's a double. So we're gonna fall half this tree out and leave the other half standing. And then eventually once the rest of this timber goes back up here, the second half of that tree is gonna go back up in here where it's leaning. You know, it's not a overwhelming tree, but it's kind of separates the men from the boys when you can fall this stuff here. When you start putting springboards in and side notching trees and peeling them off one off the other one, that's a little trickier. Despite the hazards, fallers still face pressure to produce high volumes of wood. There's always been a push to try and get workers to pull out as much volume as possible, as quickly as possible, and that clearly has increased the risks. What's made matters worse, I think, in recent years is that more and more logging is not being done by company logging crews anymore, by unionized logging crews. It's being done by smaller uh, contractors so they don't have that layer of protection that they once had. When fallers were forced to become independent contractors, they also lost their union status. Because of a technicality, the union that represents employees in the forest industry, the United Steelworkers, refuses to represent independent fallers. I've had this ongoing battle with the union for almost 30 years. According to Daryl Wong, who's the president of what's now the United Steelworkers, which used to be the IWA, it's not in their constitution for them to represent independent contractors. They can represent employees, but not independent contractors. So I said to Daryl, well, then change the constitution. Well, we're working on it. Well, they've been working on it for over 20 years. Well, I mean, we re rewrote the constitution of the entire country. And that didn't take them 20 years. So, I mean, I would think that if the heart was really in it for the union, and that was their honest desire to represent individuals, they would have changed the Constitution. How hard could it be? My father and my grandfather fought and got unions going and got us all the benefits so that we got medical, dental, pension plans. We got a set of rain gear every year. We got paid for our statutory holidays. So they had to figure out some way to get rid of that. 
so they make you be an independent contractor, run your own company, you get none of that. All of that stuff's gone. Now, I've been 36 years in the bush, and I've got no pension plan. My brother was 30 years in the fire department down in Victoria, and he's got a great pension. You know, we started in the woods together, and, and he took a look around and said, uh, I don't think this is for me, and he joined the fire department, and he retired two years ago. I got 36 years in, I'll be working until I drop dead or sell the farm. <laughs> They're going to have a hard time to talk us followers into getting back in the serious union mode again because they haven't done anything for us. I had a case where I went to a union guy because I was an independent. He didn't even want to talk to me. But I was expected to pay union dues. And I did for years. I've been paying union dues off and on ever since 1973. And I went into this union guy because uh, the contractor was deducting uh, the, the money from my check to pay all the benefits and the pension and everything, and he kept it. He didn't uh, send it in, so I went and said, well, what are you going to do to help me out here? Like, I'm paying union dues now. He said, we can't help you, you're an independent. So that was it for me. I just not expecting to get any help from the union. Without the protection of a union and forced to work in unsafe conditions, fallers became desperate. Determined to make a change, they finally took their concerns to the media. When I started looking into this story, people like Bill Boardman, like Mike McKibben, they started setting up networks where they started talking to their pals out in the bush, and any time an incident happened, then it would be passed on to me. And I would find out within hours sometimes of a fatality in the bush. And that gave it an immediacy and an urgency that hadn't happened before. And I think the turning point came in November of 2005 when the death of a faller actually made the front page of the Vancouver Sun. Forest Company executives started paying attention. But for fallers, that attention would bring new pressures, new sources of stress, and would have mixed results. Kashmir is softness. Kashmir is luxurious. Kashmir is irresistible. Kashmir is now in a bathroom tissue. dishes keep coming out wet. It's not your dishwasher. You need new Jet Dry Turbo Dry. It's a powerful drying agent for amazingly drier dishes straight out of dishwasher, even plastics. No more towel drying. New Jet Dry Turbo Dry and the dishes are done. This is Susan Hay. Snow changing to freezing rain in the morning. Your morning reading minus three. Wake Up Weather is brought to you by Carnation Hot Chocolate, a warm hug. 52 inches of glorious HD. Uh, that's not an HD. <laughs> yes, it is. No, it isn't. It's distorted. Look how squished Kalnikov is. No, he's just short. Short, yeah. You need the Rogers HD box for true HD TV and to get the most HD sports, the most HD movies, only from Rogers. Rookie card. Nice. My son really needs that one for his set. It's really hard to come by. Sorry. 
trade you for it. What do you got? What do you want? What do you have? What do you need? Upper Deck NHL hockey cards are now at McDonald's, the official currency of hockey fans. In 2005, a record number of deaths in the woods finally caught the attention of the public. The forest industry reacted through the Workers' Compensation Board, or the WCB, a government agency that most fallers regard as misguided. A faller told me a story one time of the Workers' Compensation Board uh, official came out and gave them a slideshow on safety. And he was lecturing to them how to safely fall trees using slides. Well, one of the slides was upside down. And one of the fallers in the audience, an advocate, very rough fellow, he gets up and he says, well, just a minute here, you know, if we did that kind of thing in the bush, we'd be dead. But you make a mistake like that and it's nothing. But if we did it, we'd be dead. And I think that gets to the root of the cultural difference between the Workers' Compensation Board and the fallers, that uh, they're both looking at things from totally different perspectives. WCB investigators began to put pressure on fallers by increasing the number of safety audits. A part of the job they focus on is the shape of a cut stump, one indicator of whether a tree was felled safely. Now, if you look at that stump, that's what you've got, holding wood, all the way across. Almost a uniform width of holding wood. And there's that's what they call a step right here. And if you look at this, that's absolutely perfect. There's no doubling up on the cuts. What they're saying is unacceptable is if you can lay a pen, if there's a flat piece of wood where this, you know, the first cut comes in flat, and then this one comes up to match it. If that flat cut goes farther in here and you can lay a pencil on the little lip that's there, that's unacceptable, okay? And they'll write you up for that. Well, that's not much. You know, if you're talking about five or a six foot tree and you're only out a pencil width on a part of the undercut, that's not very much. So I'm not against the audits, but I mean, if you wanted to, and if you had it in for somebody, you could go out into everybody's quarter and you could find one or two bad stumps. You know, don't, don't mention the 300 good ones, just look at those one or two bad ones. Well, that's not right. I think the workers' compensation board is trying to use the cookbook approach. They're saying, okay, we're gonna look at the stump or whatever, and that's such a small part of the picture. There's techniques that have been passed down for generations that are tried and true and safe, and sometimes you need to use them. And now, in the back of your head, when you get in a really bad situation, is, oh, is somebody gonna come and look at this later and decide to pull my certificate so I can never work again? Now that right there, I mean, you, you want the guy focused 100% on the job. You don't even want him thinking that somebody may come and somehow threaten his livelihood because they weren't there when you did it. That's why we get mad at Compo because it's not about, the stump's very important, but it's, you know, the key is knowing what you're doing, right? Laying the wood out right, making it safe all the way along, do it, dealing with everything in the right order. The stump is a small part of it. Everybody I know that has any kind of knowledge or skill in my age group is all saying, what's the point? I mean, it's, it's pretty difficult to go do a job and then have somebody come and say, you didn't do that right. And you hand him the power saw and say, well, show me. And he says, oh, no, I don't know how to do it. I just know you didn't do it right. Well, that, that's pretty difficult. There's so much hogwash, people running around telling you what's safe and what isn't. This people as usually has never done the job. I'm not out here to try to commit suicide. I got a lot of dead friends that get killed doing this job. And I try to stay alive. Like, I don't go around doing dumb things just for the heck of it.
I feel insulted that they went out and made a whole bunch of new regulations for us guys, and they didn't talk to the experienced guys that I know of, who's making these regulations. In an effort to help those making the regulations, the WCB, Fallers published a report outlining their views on what should be done to increase safety. But the report was ignored. We've always had fatalities in our industry, but already this year we're in big trouble. We're having fatalities and serious injuries. I think it's going to only get worse with this approach that they're taking. If I got to stop and think there's a bush cop coming down here to check, make sure I cut a corner off and he's going to write me up for it, it's breaking my focus. You know what I mean? Like you just don't do that out here where it's dangerous. We got to stay focused. It's gotten bad, really bad, and like I say, none of my boys will ever do it because I wouldn't allow them, my sons to be treated like that, ever. Since being downsized by timber companies, fallers have had to pay their own insurance premiums to the Workers' Compensation Board. A dispute with the WCB over premiums led to fallers banding together to take a stand. You're all in favor. Originally, the Western Fallers Association was formed to combat a decision made by the Workers' Compensation Board to raise the rates that we pay our compensation on. I mean, it was going to triple. So if, you're, if your rate was $3,000 a year to pay compensation, you were going to be paying almost $10,000 in compo. We decided to hold round-the-province meetings. It was interesting that this was the first time that all of these independent fallers got to meet each other and started talking. And I'm happy to say that the compensation actually backed up, and I'd never seen anybody do that to them before. I know this year we signed on quite a few guys. Yes. It's important because the membership is important. We need to, we need to keep going in that direction. I mean, we're in the position right now to really go somewhere with it. Our mandate is to make the workplace safer for fallers, to give ourselves a voice in the industry to people like WCB to say, hey, here we are, you know, we're not this invisible thing, we actually have a voice here and a face. Despite early success with the Western Fallers Association, fallers still face huge challenges in making their jobs safe and secure for the future. rich Swiss chocolate and discover honey and almond nuggets hidden within. Lose yourself. This holiday season, unwrap a Toblerone. Your lips go through a lot in a day. They're always pursing and pressing. Or they're flapping, flirting, kissing, buzzing, and just clowning around. So help them do it all with new Polysporin Daily Lip Care. Use it every day to keep lips healthy looking and at their best. Because there are no hats or gloves for lips. They're just out there taking whatever hits them. New Polysporin Daily Lip Care. Put on the poly. What's wrong with my dishwasher? Well, here's your problem. Over time, limescale and grease can build up in hard-to-see places like the heating coil and sprayer arms. Use Jet Dry Dishwasher Cleaner once a month to remove buildup and help keep your dishwasher working like it should. Jet Dry for a sparkling shine every time. You inherit your father's eyes. Do you have to inherit your mother's cancer? Genetics do play a part in breast cancer. That's why no two breast cancers are alike. Our latest research shows that there's also variation and how women respond to treatment. We're using this new knowledge to plan individualized treatment. At Women's College Hospital, we believe successful cancer therapy must be as individual as the disease. That's new thinking.
The Canadian Cancer Society Lottery's early bird deadline is this Friday. Buy your ticket now and you could win one of three early bird prizes of $100,000. Hurry! Only six days left. Order your ticket today. Excuse me, sir. Are you the famous Colgate 360? Yes, I am. Is it true you have a tongue cleaner? Actually, it's a cheek and tongue cleaner. Wow. You see, kid, 80% of bacteria are not on your teeth. Colgate 360 cleans teeth, gums, cheeks, and tongue, removing more bacteria for a whole mouth clean. I want to have a cheek and tongue cleaner just like you. <laughs> Colgate 360 is now also available with the power of sonic vibrations. Colgate 360 Microsonic Power for a healthier whole mouth clean. Colgate, recommended by dentists. Where's the dirt? For generations, fallers have worked in a bottom line business that had little regard for safety. And over the years, training programs to improve safety were abandoned by timber companies as too costly. But recent publicity has forced the industry to reconsider. I think it's tied to the fact that the general public over the last two, three years have said, this is unacceptable. And people in the industry have said, you're right, it is unacceptable. And there's been a very broad, conscientious desire on everyone's part to try and do the things they need to do to improve safety performance and maybe, maybe the start of a trend. But you really have to wait another five years to find that out. Traditionally, fallers trained other fallers, but new regulations have excluded them from the training process. We're not even allowed to train people anymore, according to the compensation board. I mean, we've been training people, me personally, over 20 years. We happen to have been trained by really good guys that really knew their stuff. And so we're just passing that down. But part of that is, hey, if you're not comfortable, walk away. You don't let the company tell you what to do. You don't let anybody tell you what to do because your life's on the line. You do it right, so it's safe. That's the biggest thing, is to change it so it's not just production, 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 and change it back so people have pride in their work and are able to do it and hold their head up at the end of the day. Personally, I'd like to see us older guys getting involved in training younger guys so that we can make it safer. Forget the regulations and all this stuff. Of course, you need to make good stumps but let's do this safely. And that's probably one of the few reasons why I'm left doing it is because I want to see the next generation of fallers come up like the fallers that I came up with in the early 70s. The way it's going, that's not going to happen, but I'd like to help change that. Even with the best training, most fallers accept that falling trees is always going to be a high-risk job. What's more difficult to accept is putting their lives on the line to do a job they know could be done better. This log's rotten, you saw in the butt, right? It's a shame they're having us clear cut this. Well, if you select cut this, this would be left. And so you have a five, six foot tree here that'd be left that's still alive, still soaks up water, still got habitat characteristics, Birds can live in it. This is prime murrelet habitat and all that sort of stuff. And uh, the government says clear cut it, so we're, we're clear cutting it. This ain't our choice. We only do what the government lets us do. That's all we're allowed to do. Because so. we're only dumb loggers, right? We don't have the expertise to understand the issues. Okay, I gotta buck this thing now. Although 90% of logging in British Columbia is clear cutting, Fallers like Mike Hennigan argue for an alternative, select logging, taking out single trees without disturbing those around them. There's a logging system available where the habitat's left totally intact. Everything that was living there before can live there after quite comfortably. And this is according to biologists that are fairly radical environmentalists. And yet, you're not allowed to do it. Now that's, that's pretty frustrating as a logger because everybody likes to vilify us and yet we're able to do a job that the public would like but because of government and mostly government regulations we're not allowed to do it if you have any kind of pride in your work uh, that's really frustrating 
So then it becomes, why are we here? And if you're just there for the money, forget it. You're gonna, you're gonna get hurt. <laughs> you gotta be there because you like it, you enjoy it. You can't be there for the money. Rookie card. Nice. My son really needs that one for his set. It's really hard to come by. Sorry. Trade you for it. What do you got? What do you want? What do you have? What do you need? Upper Deck NHL hockey cards are now at McDonald's, the official currency of hockey fans. <laughs> Hear the applause at Bellevue Casino Resort in Niagara Falls. Legendary doo group Little Anthony and the Imperials perform January 11th and 12th and take a journey through the growth of Motown with Solid Gold Motown in January. For more concert information, visit BellevueCasinoResort.com. See, my dishes keep coming out wet. It's not your dishwasher. You need new Jet Dry Turbo Dry. It's a powerful drying agent for amazingly drier dishes straight out of the dishwasher, even plastics. No more towel drying. New Jet Dry Turbo Dry and the dishes are done. The best rock climbing spots are remote. That's why I drive a Suzuki Grand Vitar. Drug and all terrain, just like me. Oh, come on. The Grand Vitar isn't just for extreme dudes. It's also for average Joes. Guys that take their kids to school and their dog to the vet. You know, normal people stuff. Hey, by the way, nice tattoo. Real original. The all-new Suzuki Grand Vitara. Available with 0% purchase financing. It fits your lifestyle, whatever it happens to be. Business owners know that the cure for stress is resolve. That one small idea can take you round the world. That family kitchens are great places to dream. And that's why business is banking at Canada's credit unions. Thousands of entrepreneurs, hundreds of financial experts, one network. It's who you know. We see what most don't. Christmas, we ask you to open your eyes and your heart and give. Cashmere is softness. Cashmere is luxurious. Cashmere is irresistible. Cashmere is now in a bathroom tissue. You are hosting a meet the illegitimate daughter dinner. Over the past few years, fallers have applied their skills in new and innovative ways. This stand of spruce trees on the Queen Charlotte Islands was select logged five years ago. The fallers 